The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them, Hallelujah, oh, Hallelujah. Instead of the gospel reading that is proper for the day, I'm going to take the gospel reading that is proper for this votive mass in honor of the passion, the martyrdom of St. John the Baptist. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it? And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy. And upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends, neighbors, and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, when not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it. And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be, re will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A man had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the young son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he, and he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but no one gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? And here am I, dying of hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him, and he was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, 
Look, all these years I have served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. Sometimes it takes me several times of seeing something and seeing the same thing over and over again for years before I finally connect the dots and I go, oh, well, that's what it is. To give you an example of a, of a moment just recently where I was able to connect the dots, the stained glass windows in the sacristy of St. Mary's in Hampton. Now, as you all know, I go or at least during the summer schedule of the Mass. I, I go over to St. Mary's of Hampton and offer Mass there three times a week. And I've been doing this, what, I'm on year number nine. And I go in there, and what has puzzled me about the sacristy is that there are three stained glass windows in there, and I don't get the theme of them. Now, don't get me wrong, they're beautiful stained glass windows. And if you're ever at... St. Mary's of Hampton, I invite you to go in the sacristy and look at them. But here's what I don't get. You know, a sacristy, you know, like that little room over there? The whole purpose of a sacristy is to store the sacred things, you know, the chalices, the, the vestments. And so, typically, if you have any decoration in a sacristy, they're like of a chalice or of a monstrance or various forms of vestment, but you won't see that in the sacristy of St. Mary's of Hampton. Instead, all three of these stained glass windows is of Jesus associated with children. Uh, one stained glass window is Jesus as a child working for his foster father, Joseph, and Mary's in the background watching this. And then another one, is kind of in the center, is the child Jesus. If you remember, he got lost, and after three days, they finally found him in the temple, and what is he doing? This child is teaching the experts of the laws who are old men. So that's depicted in kind of the, the middle stained glass window. And then the final one is Jesus as an adult, and he just got done saying, let the little children come to me, and he's blessing these little children. Now, don't get me wrong, it's a great theme, right? But why that theme in the sacristy? Well, I've been wondering this, like, for eight going on nine years, until finally... I went, oh yeah, now I remember. This sacristy was remodeled so that it could also be used as a cry room. And I had been told that, but I never made all the connections. And so all of a sudden it made perfect sense to me because in addition to these stained glass windows that pertain to children and Jesus, in the sacristy at St. Mary's in Hampton you have this big window where people in the sacristy can look through and see what's going on in the sanctuary. And there's a speaker in there. So that anyone who's in the sacristy and you have the doors closed, you can hear what's going on in church. So it finally dawned on me after now year number nine, oh, this is the cry room at St. Mary's of Hampton. Now, I think it will take me another nine years to figure out this mystery. Now, in my going on nine years here, no one has used that sacristy as a cry room. You know, no children. Well, I don't remember. None of the masses that I did. Someone's, someone's going, you remember that? or No. Okay. But anyway, um, I don't remember any parent taking their kids into this cry room. So, you know, I'm wondering, well, why is that? Why... Is there something wrong with it? Is it? So I'll tell you what. I don't want to go into all that. But tell you what. If you want to send me an email and give me your insights on why no one wants to use that cry room at St. Mary's, 
Go ahead, send me an email so I'm not wondering for another nine years why that's so. Why am I thinking of this? Well, this is this weekend is Catechetical Sunday. And there is always with Catechetical Sunday an emphasis on Jesus teaching the little children. But if you really look at the Gospels, if the truth be known, you never see Jesus teaching little children. Now, granted, you have that where he says, let the children come to me, and he does bless them. But you don't have a gospel account of Jesus sitting down and teaching a religion class to children. Whenever he's preaching, it's usually in a public square or in the temple or in the synagogue. And who is he teaching? He's teaching adults. And once you get that in your head, that everything in the gospel is really geared towards adults, then a little light bulb goes off in your head and you go, ah, now I understand why Jesus used parables so much because of this. You know, parables are meant for adults because they don't give you a nice, simple answer. Parables have usually multiple layers of meanings. You could get more than one meaning out of it. So when Jesus uses these parables, he's challenging us as adults to think, to think how this parable might relate to us in our personal lives. Now, what I just said, I realize is controversial. There are those scripture scholars who say just the opposite. They will say, well, the very reason why Jesus used parables is so that even children could get a simple message out of those parables. And you know what? That might be the case. And it is true that with these parables, it doesn't matter how intelligent you are or how much education you get, you can always get some message out of these parables. But I would make the argument, when you look at the historical context of how Jesus, when he's preaching these parables, that that doesn't, that doesn't hold water. Because many times, as you heard in this gospel, it is often part of a debate that he's having with other adults, in particular the religious authorities. So I would make the argument that these parables that you hear in this gospel, they're not really meant for children. They're meant for us, for adults. And they're meant to force us to really think how the kingdom of God is reflecting their life, how this could apply to us. So with that in mind, this evening I'm going to treat you like adults. And I want to focus your attention on the three parables that you just heard. Now you notice, there's two little parables, but then there's that long parable. It's so long that there's an option where you could cut it out. The short form cuts out hey, that cheers, long Kratos. parable. The just updating the website. Story. You're going to play a little Thieves Guild when I get done. I want done. to cover all three of these parables together. Because what scripture scholars tell us, that all three of these parables go together. They should be read together. Because together, they're describing the sort of incredible love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. Now, as I said, when you look at parables, you can get a lot of meanings out of them. Matter of fact, I just gave a, a day of reflection to a bunch of school teachers, Catholic school teachers out of Nauvoo, and I spent a whole hour just talking about the prodigal son parable. I'm not going to do that tonight. For the sake of brevity tonight, I'm going to focus on three characteristics that, that God has when it comes to his love for us. First of all, that his love is like that shepherd. His love is so strong for us that he never gives up on us and he constantly pursues us. Jesus is a good shepherd. And, you know, God is so serious about pursuing us. You know what he did? God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world that we would not die in sin, but we'd have life. And so Jesus is the manifestation of the Father's desire to pursue us until we finally love him back. And not only that, Jesus, the good shepherd, he constantly pursues us through the Holy Spirit because this is what we believe especially for us who are baptized. That Holy Spirit is constantly speaking to us. 
And when we have wandered off, and you hear that voice within you that says, I need to go back to church. I need to change my life in that way. Come, seek me out. That's the good shepherd who is pursuing you, and he will not give up, he will not give up on you until you turn and accept him. Which leads me to the other characteristics of God's love for us. That not only is he persistent, but he's like that widow, that one we finally turn and return to the Lord. That he's happy about it. He's not nonchalant about our return. Now, whenever I hear about this widow, how overjoyed she is about this lost coin, you know, uh, I, matter of fact, something that just occurred to me recently, there was a, an object that I had lost for 10 years, and I just found it. And believe me, St. Anthony didn't help me out at all. He kept me waiting. So, you know, at the time, 10 years ago, when I, I lost this thing, I was so angry, and I say, well, I need this, you know? I mean, the world will stop if I don't have this object, right? Well, to be honest with you, I completely forgot about it. And then I was going through a box. And what, well, lo and behold, as I dug through this box, you know what I found? That object that I needed desperately for, ten, you know, 10 years ago. And I pulled it out. And I kind of laughed at myself and I said, well, I guess I didn't need it all that much. Now, the point I'm making here is when it comes to God, he doesn't have that sort of love. It's not like, you know, if we return and we enter the gates of heaven, he wouldn't say, well, you know what, you've been gone for about 10 years, but I really didn't miss you all that much. No, that's not the sort of love that God has. When we return, he's ecstatic. There's more rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner than 99 righteous. So God's love for us, it is persistent and it's filled with joy. But here's the next thing. God will, will sacrifice anything in order to get us back. Now you heard about the prodigal son story. I mean, we've heard it a million times, right? And I think most of us, the happy news is, you know, the younger son, the prodigal son, he's back, right? But you know, if you really think of it, that father, it cost him something. There was a cost to that mercy. Because this no good son, who never did a lick of work on the farm, yes, he got him back, but you know who he lost in the process? The one older son who was dependable. The one older son who was loyal. The one older son who stayed and worked and provided for the father. You know, I don't know about you, you know, you look at that. I mean, obviously we would say, oh, isn't it happy that the prodigal son came back? But, you know, you think about it. Hmm, this no good son or the son who keeps me fed? Hmm, which one should I take? Now think about this. The father sacrificed the obedient son, the faithful son, in order to get back the one who is no good. That's the sort of love that God the Father has for each and every one of us. Now, of course, scripture scholars, when they talk about the younger son who's the prodigal son and the older son who's the faithful son, they would tell us that the older son are all the people who follow the rules. They were the religious leaders, scribes and Pharisees. They're the ones who kept things going, whereas the younger son represented the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitute, who completely failed to be faithful to God's ways. And I'm not questioning that at all. And you know, you look at it just from that perspective, it was an incredible sacrifice, because Jesus knew, by accepting these, this, these sinners, the ones who were loyal and obedient, he knew that he'd be alienating all these folks, and yet he did it anyway. But I can't help but to think, that maybe there's a deeper level to this. That the older son, that the father sacrificed in order to get the younger son back, could we not say the older son is Jesus? I mean, after all, he's the only begotten son of the father. 
You know, we're all sinners. We're all really the prodigal children. The only one that can really claim to be the obedient son, the faithful son, is Jesus. Now think about this. The father sacrificed the only son he had, the one that was obedient. He allowed him to be sacrificed on the cross in order to get we, the no good prodigals, back. God the Father is willing to sacrifice anything in order to bring us back, to get us to love him. Now, I think I need to make this qualification. There's an important difference between the older son in this parable and Jesus. Now, if you remember, no amount, no amount of coaxing by the Father could get the older son to come back, to enter the party, right? To enter the house. That's not the case with Jesus. Not only did Jesus, with his resurrection, not only did he go back in the house, but he actually took us, the no good children, he took us by the hand and led us into the Father's house. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places, and I have prepared a place for you, each and every one of you. That's an important difference when we talk about the older son in this prodigal son story versus Jesus. Jesus didn't wait outside and pout. He joined us and led us into the Father's house. Gravy. That's the... Uh, in addition to this being the 24th Sunday of Ordinary oh, Time... Oh, man, i got to pay better attention to that. We have a twin memorial... Saturday, I pasted that in here and then capitalized all the headings. The and, and we're publishing. So September 15th that is, is the complimentary that's the bulletin and the schedule. And now what we have next is the now prayer request I want to request draw list. your attention to our statue of Mary. And Lisa Fox was kind enough to set up this display to illustrate the seven sorrows of Mary. And you notice the seven swords that pierced her heart. Remember at the presentation where Simeon says, a sword of sorrow will pierce your heart. We could say that it wasn't once, but seven times, that as a result of taking care of Jesus, that she suffered horribly. St. Paul, in his letter to the Hebrews, he emphasizes three strong words. He says that Jesus learned, he obeyed, and he suffered. Jesus came into the world to learn how to be a man. And by being a man, he walked with men and women. And he came into the world to obey. And he obeyed, even to the point of giving his life on the cross. But how did he learn? How was he obedient? He learned through suffering. And the Blessed Virgin Mary the new Eve, as St. Paul calls her, in order to participate, to walk with Jesus on his journey. She had to go through the same thing. She learned. She obeyed. She suffered. And thus, at her place at the foot of the cross, she earns her right to be a mother to us. We adore you, Christ, we bless you, because by your cross you have redeemed the world. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, 
so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. We could make the argument that every day is a celebration of the Holy Cross, not just today. We begin and end each of our prayers with the sign of the cross. The Mass is a sharing in the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross. In baptism, we are first marked on the forehead with the sign of the cross. All this being true, Still, there are two liturgical feast days where we emphasize the cross more than others. One of them would, of course, be Good Friday. The other would be today's feast in honor of the triumph of the Holy Cross. Good Friday is, of course, the supreme celebration of the Holy Cross. It was on Good Friday that our Lord died upon the cross and saved us from our sins. Obviously, that's the priority. You don't get any higher than that, if you will, in terms of the exaltation of the cross. However, Good Friday, it's tinged with sadness. We're reminded of the horrible things that occurred to our Lord, and we can't help but to feel a little bit of sadness in our hearts. Although, with the liturgical changes to, uh, that occurred as a result of Vatican II, there was, there was an attempt, if you will, to shift a little bit away from the gloom and doom of Good Friday to the triumph of the cross. Maybe some of you are old enough to remember that before 1970, the official liturgical color for the Good Friday service was actually black. It was a day of mourning. And along with it, of course, much of this has been lost, that because it was a day of mourning, all the shops were closed, and it was, everything was draped in black because our Lord died. It was an official day of mourning for Christians. But with the changes of the Second Vatican Council, instead of using black for Good Friday, you will notice that we use red. And again, it's going back to an earlier tradition, liturgical tradition, going back to the patristic fathers of looking upon the cross as our Lord's triumph. I mean, he took upon the world, the, he took upon himself the, wor the worst that the world and devil can throw at anyone, the threat of death, and he conquered it. Well, still, even with that shift in emphasis on the Good Friday service, I think we could still say it's still a day that is tinged with sadness, with tears. Now today we celebrate the triumph of the Holy Cross. It's free of the tinge of sadness that we would have on Good Friday. Today we celebrate the fact that the cross has triumphed over the whole world. For the first 300 years of the church's, of the church's history, Christians lived under the shadow of the cross. Many Christians were crucified like our Lord by a government that was out to exterminate this new religion. Then the miraculous occurred. In 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine made Christianity legal, and he made it the official religion of the imperial family. Now, in the Eastern Church, the, I should say the Greek Orthodox Church and the Russian Church, they actually make Constantine a saint, a canonized saint. That's not the case in the Roman church. And I think if the truth be known, for most of his life, Constantine was not a saint, although he did legalize Christianity. Uh, he did, he, if the truth be known, Constantine was not baptized a Christian until on his deathbed because he knew he had to do all sorts of unchristian things in order to maintain power. Now, if someone that we do recognize as a saint, if we could say the true saint 
of the, of the imperial family was not Constantine, but it was his mother, St. Helena, or do you say St. Helena? I guess you could say it either way. Well, St. Hel Helena was a true believer, and both the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church recognize her as a canonized saint. And we know that after Constantine made Christianity legal, St. Hel Saint Hel Saint Helena, she went to Jerusalem in order to set up shrines at the various places that were associated with our Lord. And supposedly, she found the remains of the Holy Cross. And again, there's a whole story, and I can't tell you off the top of my head what it is, but how she was certain that this cross was the cross of Christ. Well, to jump to the kind of the end story, end of the story, after she found the true cross, she supervised the building of a church over the site where Jesus was buried and transferring the remains of that cross to that location. And it was on this date when a cross found its home in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And, by the way, I've been, I've been in this church. It's fascinating. You know, you have this huge basilica built over the, over the tomb of, of our Lord. And uh, there's actually, in addition to this big basilica, there's another little church within that you have to go in in order to go into the cave where Jesus was buried. I've actually have had mass there. But uh, jumping back to our story. Now, this was a huge event. You know, the establishment of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and to have a relic of the true cross in there. And it was important in more ways than one. Now imagine the same government that crucified Christians on the cross for hundreds of years was now venerating the cross as a symbol of redemption. Truly, this moment that we are celebrating today, it, it's, it's celebrating the triumph of the cross even over the might of the Roman Empire. Well, I want to mention a couple of things while I'm at it. You know, today's feast is the official beginning of Ember Days, which are special days of prayer, giving thanks to God for the gift of the harvest. Traditionally, Ember Days are the Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday after the Feast of the Holy Cross. Unfortunately, the adherents of Ember Days have fallen totally in disuse. But our bishop, a few years ago, he tried, he made a futile attempt to try to revive it. It's still on the diocesan calendar that yesterday, September 13th, is an official rogation day, which is a day of prayer. And it's a special day of prayer for the harvest. So I would ask you to keep in your prayers our farmers. As many of you know, they got a late start in planting as a result of, result of the drought. So many of them didn't get their corn crop in at all. Many of them are telling me that it might be Christmas before they're actually able to harvest. And they're not expecting much of a harvest if they made any attempt to plant at all. Many of them just didn't make an attempt to plant. Because after all that, all that flooding and all that rain, we were faced with, what, two, two months of drought? So whatever they got planted, it didn't really grow. So I would ask you to pray in a special way for our farmers. Now granted, thanks to government subsidies and stuff like that, they wouldn't have to suffer as much as farmers in the past. But still, I think we're going to see a detrimental effect on not only our farmers, but our entire economy. Now, of course, being today is Saturday, a day in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary, I would remind you that tomorrow is the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. Unfortunately, this feast day lands on a Sunday, and the Sunday celebration of the Lord's Day takes precedence over any celebration in honor of a saint, even if that saint happens to be the Blessed Virgin Mary. But, even though Tomorrow and tonight, we'll be using the readings and prayers and the liturgical colors for the 24th Sunday of Ordinary Time. 
You'll notice at St. John's that Lisa Fox, and I don't know how much time she spent on this, she decorated around the statue of Mary with the seven sorrows of Mary. It, it's pretty sharp. So at least Our Lady of Sorrows is getting some attention. And oh, by the way, today is Lisa Fox's birthday, so you might want to keep her in your prayers. I think it's also her mother's birthday, isn't it? I think both of them share the same birthday, Betty Plum. You know, I think, uh, well, I'm going to stick to my script here. Pope Francis in a homily that he gave in 2014 on Our Lady of Sorrows said that in these twin liturgies, we're shown the glorious cross, but then we're also shown the meek and humble mother standing next to it. And I'm quoting here from Pope Francis. In the letter to the Hebrews, Paul emphasizes three strong words. He says that Jesus learned, obeyed, and suffered. Jesus came into the world to learn how to be a man, and by being a man, walked with men. He came into the world to obey, and he obeyed. But he learned this obedience from suffering. Adam left paradise with a promise, a promise that lasted for so many centuries. But today we celebrate the fact that through this obedience, through this humiliation, through Jesus and his offering on the cross, this promise becomes our hope. And the people of God now walk with that sure hope. Even the mother of God, the new Eve, as Paul himself calls her, in order to participate in her son's journey, she too, she too learned. She too suffered. And she obeyed. And thus she becomes the mother to us. Obviously, as you've heard me say so many times, but that famous passage from the Gospel of John, John's Passion Narrative, where it was upon the cross where our Lord said to the beloved disciple, this is your mother, and to the blessed mother, this is your son. She is our mother, and it's only through the suffering she shared in at the cross that she became our mother. In conclusion, I would like to share with you this prayer to Our Lady of Sorrows. Our Mother of Sorrows, with strength from above, you stood by the cross, sharing in the sufferings of Jesus, and with tender care you bore him in your arms, mourning and weeping. We praise you for your faith, which accepted the life God planned for you. We praise you for your hope, which trusted that God would do great things in you. We praise you for your love and bearing with Jesus the sorrow of his passion. Done. Holy Mary, may we follow your example and st stand by all your children who need comfort and love. Mother of God, stand by us in our trials and care for us in our many needs. Pray Time for, for us a now of reflection. and at the hour of our death. Amen. amen. Time for a moment of reflection. Your word, O Lord, is true. Consecrate us in the truth. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus told his disciples a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? No disciple is superior to the teacher, but when fully trained, every disciple, every disciple will be like his teacher. 
Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own? <laughs> wooden How beam. You say to your brother, brother, let me remove the splinter. Yeah, there's in your own a beam eye in my eye. When you do not even notice the woman wooden beam in your own eye, you hypocrite. It's a beam. Remove the wooden beam from your own eye first. It's supportive. Then you will see clearly to remove the splinter in your brother's eye. Hmm. The gospel of the Lord. Splinter? You mean like Today, Master Splinter? The Catholic Church honors oh. Saint John Chrysostom, the patron saint of preachers and orators. So renowned was his preaching that he was given the nickname Chrysostom, which in Greek means golden mouth. Saint John Chrysostom um, was among the most prolific authors in the Catholic Church. Exceeded only by St. Augustine of Hippo in the quantity of, the, of his surviving writings. His work continues to influence the Catholic Church today. The Catechism of the Catholic Church cites him, 18, cites him in 18 sections, particularly his reflections on the Lord's Prayer. For this reason, and for many more, the church proclaims him a doctor of the church. Now, when we call a saint a doctor, it's not a medical doctor. The word doctor it comes from a Latin word, which means teacher. So he's an official teacher of the church. This title is given to those saints recognized for their contribution to Catholic theology and Catholic doctrine. Unfortunately, the golden mouth of St. John often got him in trouble. As the Patriarch of Constantinople, which was the seat of the Roman Empire at that time, he gave homilies and sermons that were highly critical of the rich and powerful. And he wasn't afraid, with the Emperor and Empress seated, seated right in front of him, to literally give homilies that were directed to them. And as you can imagine, that doesn't make those in power all that happy. Matter of fact, it especially offended the emperor's wife, Eudoxia. And he ended up actually being exiled at least three times, if my memory serves me correctly. But just give you one example. On one occasion, a silver statue of the empress Eudoxia was erected in this ceremonial square where all the ceremonies of the empire took place. And it was near his cathedral. From the pulpit, John denounced the dedication ceremonies as pagan and spoke against the empress in harsh terms. He said, and I quote, Again Herodias raves, again she is troubled. She dances again and again desires to receive John's head on a platter, an allusion to the events surrounding the death of John the Baptist and making Eudoxia the likes of Herodias. And as you can imagine, this didn't go well. He ended up banished, and not anywhere, to the very edge of the empire and on an isolated mountain in the Caucasus Mountains, in the Carpathians. Pope Innocent tried to appeal to the emperor for him, but it didn't do any good. To make a very long story short, he was worn out. He was, he was not of the best of health as it was, he eventually died in exile on September 14, 407 A.D. Now, today's 13, obviously, but even back then, the triumph of the cross was already an established feast. So that is why his, his feast, his celebration, his moral was moved to the day before. His mouth continues to get him in trouble. During his first two years as a priest in Antioch, John denounced Jews and Judaizing Christians in a series of eight homilies delivered to Christians from his own congregation. Now, the issue was they were Christians, but they were dabbling in Jewish rituals. So they liked the Jewish ceremonies better, so they kind of hopped back and forth. And John denounced this. And he said, no, you can't do this. That the Old Testament, that has passed. We're now of the New Testament can't go back and forth. And he was very harsh 
in terms of condemning Jewish police. Because of these homilies, there are those in our modern age who condemn him as being anti-Semitic. He definitely would not be the favorite of the LGBTQ community as well. St. John's criticism and learning and eloquence was applied to the ever-growing moral outrage, fear, and loathing of homosexuality. He really went to town condemning homosexuals. He describes homosexuality as the worst of sins, greater than, mur greater than murder. So, you know, we always, when we cover the saints, we cover, the, 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 we cover what we like about the saints. So those socialistic Catholic moral theologians that want to stress the preferential option of the poor, they, they definitely emphasize how he... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look at that. Look at that. Those are size. Why, oh, why are there so many size? That's one, two, three and a half ninjas worth of size. Wow, that's a lot of size. You could really knock someone down to size with all those size. I'm done. He went to town on the rich and the powerful, but they wouldn't mention anything about these homilies that would condemn Jews and homosexuals because that wouldn't necessarily fit into this age of toleration and inclusivity. All right, we'll wrap out this stream up. I'm so tired. We'll come back and do the announcements. Cheers.